Just as a reminder, um, Brad will be speaking with us about um, his study results on Old Man River watershed and the consequences of coal mining headwaters. So thank you, Brad. Thank you very much, Jen. I'm just checking everyone can hear me okay? Yes, everyone can hear you and we can see your presentation. Great. Well, good afternoon. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak at this LLG webinar. Um, the study I'm gonna talk about was conducted at the request of the Living Land Owner Group. And as you've heard, they've expressed concern about the consequences of large scale surface mining of coal proposed in the, in the headwaters of the Old Man River drainage basin. So these new proposed mines, in many ways, they represent the abandonment of the law heat era coal policy that prohibited surface mining of coal in category two lands of Alberta's east slopes. Um, and all the range of LLG's concerns is broad. Their central focus on, uh, in terms of our project is on water quality, specifically selenium, water quantity, both supply and demand, and the threatened fish species out of the West Slope cutthroat trout, whose conservation really depends on watershed integrity. So my talk will be quite short um, and present some of the key findings, but they're described in detail in a formal submitted report to the Coal Consultation Committee. So although I'll be doing the talk in, in this presentation, um, the work was done by the ELSI's group in collaboration with other consultancies that looked at water supply um, and demand and water quality, and also incorporated the work um, of Dr. Bill Donahue um, that has been referred to earlier. And Bill also has a video that's been prepared and will be available on the LNG site, which I'd strongly recommend. And I will talk very briefly about that. Um, so again, here we can see the province of Alberta. The area I'm going to talk about is the Old River, Old Man River Drainage Basin. It's about 26,000 square kilometers found in southwest Alberta. So that's the area that I'm going to talk about. And it's the headwaters of this basin that may be subjected to a significant surface coal mining trajectory. And, and we'll be talking about that. As Alan mentioned um, already, the Old Man River watershed is a key part of the headwater system that feeds the South Saskatchewan watershed, and even more broadly, the entire Saskatchewan River watershed that provides water to several million people and all their associated land uses throughout Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even down into Manitoba. So the implication here is that, you know, any significant change in water quality or water quantity in the headwaters of this basin could have profound adverse effects over a really large area. Now, these maps um, show just the headwaters of the old man, the black here being the Alberta and BC boundary. So as shown in, in green here, there are eight prospective coal surface mines currently proposed in the headwaters of the old man watershed. And that's what we looked at. These headwaters are directly east of the Elk Valley of Southeast BC. And hopefully you can see in red, the existing coal mines of the Elk Valley drainage basin. So this is a, these mines have occurred over the last several decades. So it is fair to say that the government of Alberta in many ways is exploring a mining land use trajectory very comparable to that which has occurred in the Elk Valley over the last several decades. Now the Alberta land use framework indicates the need to adopt a cumulative, cumulative effects approach to looking at land use, as this approach really allows stakeholders to better understand both the benefits and the liabilities of the various land uses. But unfortunately to date, most of the analyses and approaches that have been adopted really only look at individual mines and they're not the full suite of those. So we wanted to remedy that situation and basically ask the question of what would be the consequences if the full trajectory of these eight mines, and here we can see Tent, Grassy, Chinook, Elon South, Cabin Ridge, Isolation South, Four Stack, and Isolo. These are the eight existing mines, which are on the books right now. So what would happen if they proceeded? And so we wanted to examine that. So that's what we call our high growth scenario. In our low growth scenario, we just looked at Grassy Mountain and Tent Mountain. So three different scenarios. What would happen if, if no coal proceeds? A, let's call it a medium scenario of just Grassy and Tent and then the full eight mines. Now, before we can discuss, discuss I think mining per se, I think a little bit of commentary on the basic plumbing of the watershed is required. And as we see in these maps, really strong gradients um, in elevation, in temperature, and in pre precipitation. So there's a strong west-to-east gradient in declining 
elevation, increasing temperature, and declining pre precipitation. It's a key issue, of course, is water. So when you start looking at all this, you shouldn't be surprised that the vast majority of the precipitation is occurring in the headwaters. And so almost all water flows originates in the headwater basins and shown on the map to the left prepared by, by Stefan Quetzal at the University of Lethbridge. Now in contrast, the so blue high, that's where we're getting our water from, red low, it's where we're getting very little water from. And this map, we're looking at water use. Now water use where high is red, as so we can see almost all the water that is being used whether it be for municipal purposes or irrigation or livestock or other land uses is found in the lower regions in the eastern portion of the basin. So we're getting our water from the headwaters, we're using it downstream and of course increasingly so as the old man feeds further into the South Saskatchewan drainage basin. Now these basic dynamics of water supply and demand have been understood for several generations in Alberta. So the critical importance of the basin in Alberta's east slopes in general for provision of water quantity and quality and, and functioning foothill mountains ecosystems was first described by Euro Canadians in 1911 when the government of Alberta, sorry, the government of Canada established the Rocky Mountain Forest Reserve. It was understood that its key purpose there was water. Now this resource management mandate was subsequently transferred from federal to provincial governments in the Natural Resources Transfer Act of 1930. The Eastern Rockies Forest Conservation Board was established in 1947 to ensure that land uses in this region did not jeopardize water supply of the Saskatchewan River and to which, of course, the old man belongs. So the primacy of watershed protection was further enshrined by Premier Peter Law in the 76 Alberta Coal Policy, which prohibited coal exploration and extraction across large tracts of the eastern slopes. So each of these seminal documents shown here highlights the primary role of these slopes in sustaining water resources. So this conversation is a very old one. It seems like every time we have it, we keep coming back to the same recognition. The key purpose of these slopes in terms of value to Albertans is watershed protection. So there's a growing recognition of the precarious nature of water supply. And here you can see the dendritic nature of all of these rivers coming from the headwaters east. And I put in orange and and green here, these prospective coal mines. So there's this recognition, there's a need to manage this dynamic very cautiously if ecosystem processes and downstream land uses are to remain viable. Because as the water flows off these east slopes, this is where it comes from, mainly in winter precipitation and some spring rain, we capture it and we distribute it to these downstream land uses. And so basin residents are basically recognizing that these downstream land uses are going to be at risk if water demand and pollutants increase because of coal mining. So during the past century, the flow and use of water has changed dramatically because of the area and intensity of land use in the lower portions of the Old Man River watershed. And I just want to give some key metrics here. Right now, about 62% of the average annual water flow is allocated to various land uses, primarily irrigation, livestock, municipal, and recreation within the basin. So to put some basic math into perspective, this entire basin gets about 12 billion cubic meters of precipitation annually. That's the average, but it can easily range between eight and 16 billion cubic meters. Now of this 12 billion on average, about three quarters of it is lost to evaporation, leaving about 3.2 billion cubic meters as surface flow. And high rainfall years is gonna be more and droughts is gonna be less. Current allocations of water is high, it's about 2 billion cubic meters, and as such, the basin is considered closed to new net land water use. The government of Alberta said it's, it's closed. Now, about half of the annual flow is legally required to be allocated to Saskatchewan and all the key downstream water uses in that province. So clearly, this basin has entered a you know, precarious balance between water supply and demand, and that one, will, that one that will require you know, more precarious as climate change dynamics intensifies in the decades to future. So it's, it's closed and we're very close to the, the margins right now. And that's assuming that water in the future will be as common as it is today. And yet the climate change scenarios show us that both the frequency and intensity of droughts will increase. Now look at this chart. 
we see the histor historical records and assessments indicate that Southern Alberta and the Old Man Basin periodically experienced extreme droughts. You can see it in terms of the historical data going back to 1912. So in blue, we have the naturalized flow. What would, what would have happened in the absence of all humans and their land use? In red, we see how much water is actually flowing. We see an increasing departure between these two as we take more and more water out of these systems each decade. So our climate change analyses show that the frequency and magnitude of droughts is likely to increase in the future. And therefore, if the basin is already fully allocated, adding any additional water demand to it is a risky venture. Now, moving from just the total amount of water that flows each year, let's talk a little bit about when it flows. Obviously, the flow is highly seasonal, as we can see from these graphs, with the highest flows occurring in the, in the May to July region, and the lowest flows are occurring kind of October through to March during the winter. So under future climate change scenarios that we ran, warmer air temperatures are likely to lead to less water precipitation falling as snow, and that will result in earlier spring snow melt because in late spring or late winter, what was snow often will be rainfall. Now these factors will lead to higher winter stream flow. And if you can look at the black here in these two areas, this is the Lower Crow's Nest River, and this is the Middle Old Man River, just above the reservoir, the black represents the reference historically. And you can see that in these scenarios under climate change, it pushes to the left. So these lead to a higher winter stream flow and earlier spring, spring peak. And also, and most importantly, a substantially reduced amount of late summer and fall flows. And it's during these late summer and early winter uh, months that the greatest concern in terms of the effects of coal mining will occur in terms of their water demand. So we're going to see not only an increased frequency in, and magnitude of, of droughts, but we're going to also see that the vernal discharge of spring melt is going to occur earlier in the season, leaving less water there in the summer. So I'll come back to that point later. So now that we've reviewed some of the, you know, the kind of the basic plumbing of the basin, let's turn our attention to the simulation we worked, work we did. We explored the coal mining dynamic using simulation models and subjected the basin to six scenarios. The first three, we, we went from no coal mining to our medium case, which is just grassy and tan, to the high, which is all eight mines. And then we followed the same scenarios, but then we added um, different levels of climate change and to see what effect they would have. So we incorporating a climate change scenario, which is what we call RCP 4.5, and as we did that, we reported out on some key indicators that were important to the Livingston Land Order Group. How does it affect water supply? Is there an effect? How does it affect water demand? Is there an effect on water quality looking primarily at selenium? And how might this play out in terms of a key biodiversity indicator that of cutthroat trout and landscape integrity? So that's what we did. So a study area, the Old Man River drainage basin. We're gonna grow these mines from none to two to eight we're taking these simulation models, which is Elsie's and Raven. And then we're exploring these key indicators. So it's also important to remember that all of this is occurring in the headwaters of the old man, which is directly east, like literally 20 kilometers east of an area in the Elk Valley of Southeast BC that has already had you know, a significant amount of coal mining over the last several decades. So it becomes a very important comparative landscape for us to look at dynamics about selenium release and the equations that best explain it, and also about reclamation trajectories so that we can use the best comparative data. So let's summarize a little bit. What we found that if these eight coal mines proceed on the leases, and these leases currently are 512 square kilometers, they would create a direct footprint that's minimally 93.4 square kilometers. They would achieve a maximum coal production of about 24 million metric ton per year. They would remove 700 million metric ton of coal that would be marketed cumulatively over five decades. So that's a cumulative value. And they would displace about 7 billion metric ton of waste rock or the overburden rock in order to extract that 700 million metric ton. Now this level of coal production, if you were to combust the coal, which it will be, in terms of total 
total combustion cradle to grave would generate about 2 billion metric ton of CO2e over the next five decades. So here's the Old Man River drainage basin. As Bobby and Alan already mentioned, there already are legacy mines. You can see them here and here. It's grassy and tan. And so now we're going to simulate them. We're going to zoom in to the headwaters of the Old Man. So the Elk Valley is over here in gray. And so this is today. This would be in a decade, two decades, three decades, four decades, and five decades. So this would be the cumulative area or gross area footprint of just the active mining and the overburdened pits. It doesn't incorporate many of the other linear features that Alan was talking about. So this in many ways is a conservative estimate but gives you a visual understanding of how much area, and that's about 94 square kilometers. So if we look at coal production and the graphs on the left are always a medium scenario of just grassy intent and the ones on the right are all of them. So let's look at the ones at the right because I think they illustrate the point. Well, is a coal production would grow rapidly, peak at around 24 million metric ton per year by about year 25 and then would gradually decline. And over that period of time, we'd see um, a total of about 700 million metric ton removed. Metal, metallurgical coal destined to primarily China. Now, to do so, we'd have to disturb a bunch of area. So that area, in terms of disturbance per year, would grow rapidly, would peak at around 325 hectares per year, and then would gradually decline. The total cumulative amount of area um, that would be disturbed would be about 94 square kilometers. Now, to get at the coal, you've got to remove the overburden. So that's, you could, we can call that waste rock. So waste rock displacement starts at zero. It would increase rapidly and would peak at about 200 million metric or 200 million cubic meters by a year 20. And it would gradually decline. And over that period, the total amount would be about 6 billion cubic meters that would be displaced. So to get at 700 million metric ton of coal, you would have to displace about 6 billion cubic meters of overburden. Now, for some of you, you're probably wondering, you know, just how much is that? So here's the iconic Crow's Nest Mountain. And a cubic kilometer, kilometer by kilometer by kilometer, cubic kilometer, is 1 billion cubic meters. So under the medium case scenario, where only grassy intent go forward, you'd be displacing um, about 1.3 cubic kilometers, which would be equivalent to about 1.1 crow's nest mountains. That's about how much you'd have to disturb to get at that medium scenario. Now, if you go to the high coal scenario, um, all eight mines, you would have to disturb about seven cubic kilometers. So actually 6.7 cubic kilometers, and that'd be equal to about 5.2 crow's nest mountains. So just to give you an idea of how much volume of material has to be displaced to get at at 700 million cubic meters. So if you're going to displace that amount of waste rock, that introduces the issue of selenium because selenium is going to get mobilized. If you provide selenium access to oxygen and air and water, it's going to be mobilized. So using in industry accepted equations that relate waste rock to selenium production, we have simulated a total selenium load would approach about 275 metric ton cumulatively over five decades. And that's what we see here, and would generate a maximum about 10 metric ton per year by decade five. That's what we see here. Each one of these different colors represents the different lines that we're simulating. Now, headwater tributaries are going to be particularly sensitive to water quality degradation since they bear the full brunt of all the selenium load. But since they're up high in, in the basin, they contain relatively little stream flow to aid in dilution at that point. So likewise, the source of water used for, for the mining operations is likely to be largely concentrated in these same headwater subbasins, where they make up a great proportion of stream flow and would exacerbate water quality concerns. So the highest concentration is going to be immediately below the mine, and that's also the part of the mine which is going to lose the greatest proportion of its water because there's very little water there. So a what that tells us is that there's obviously a really strong reliance on mitigation strategies what some people would call selenium attenuation 
um, how do you get the selenium out of the water? And if you don't do a good job, you're not going to achieve these limits, these thresholds, these guidelines on selenium. As Alan mentioned, selenium is naturally in water, but at very low concentrations. We actually need it, but at very low concentrations. And it's very easy to put too much selenium in the water and cause all sorts of toxicity issues, whether it be the morphological ones to West Slope cutthroat trout or influencing soil quality in terms of ability to um, grow irrigation crops or to even have water that is, is useful for, for livestock. So undeniably, these coal mines will produce a lot of selenium. The key question is how well can they get it out? So what we did is we looked at the current guidelines by various governments, including the government of Alberta Irrigation and their aquatic life and said, okay, if these mines go forward, what fraction of the selenium needs to come out in order for them to, um, for that water to be useful for these purposes? Now, of course, as the water goes further downstream, it's being, it's growing in, in volume because other streams are coming into it. So the volume is increasing and therefore the concentration is being diluted. But what you see is that selenium declines downstream as a constant you know, selenium input. The load is progressively diluted, just as I mentioned. But that said, these results emphasize the critical importance of rem removing selenium from water courses at or immediately downstream of the coal mines. So to maintain that quality within our accepted standards by the government of Alberta, what we're seeing is that between 90 and 99% of selenium must be removed from these waterways. Now, this level of attenuation is likely required for temporal spans. It could be, it will be certainly decades. It could be multiple centuries. And there does not currently exist any proof that such high levels of selenium removal can be successfully completed over such large temporal and spatial scales, and also the variable climatic conditions that we can expect to encounter. So it's a very difficult thing to remove that much selenium over that much period of time and over those large spatial scales. That's a very difficult thing to ask industry to do. Now, at this point, I'd like to jump back to one of Bill Donahue's slides and where he, as Alan described, look at a, a variety of heavy metals and other toxins and other compounds directly above and below um, coal mines, um, specifically Lusker, Greg, and, and Cheviot in the coal branch area of Alberta and one would suggest, and these are log scale, that the concentrations downstream are just the same as upstream. Here, they'd be 10 times higher. Here, they'd be 100 times higher. Here, they'd be 1,000 times higher. And what these empirical changes that Bill was able to demonstrate to quality of surface water, um, he's, he's actually documented in this video that uh, will be on the Livingston Landowners Group. But his results show consistent and large increases in concentration of many of these heavy metals and other compounds in the surface water immediately downstream from existing coal mines in comparison to identical sites found directly upstream. And it just reminds us of the magnitude of changes that can occur spatially and temporally. And um, these changes may propagate themselves for exceptionally long periods of time. Now, what we're going to do here is look at a uh, shift from water quality to water quantity. And as shown in this slide, what we're seeing is the average fraction of water removed by coal mining. And down at the lower part of the basin, it's very, very small fraction. So I think it's safe to say that coal mines are not going to use much water at the scale of the entire Old Man Drainage Basin. They use about, I don't know, 0.25 cubic meters of water per cubic meter of coal that's produced. Now, guaranteed, or assuredly, that's a small fraction of the entire basin. But look what happens when you start moving from the lower part of the basins, row by row, up higher. Here that's using like three quarters of 1%, 2%, maybe 6%, 10%, 12%, 12%, 10 We get up to the headwaters, such as Dutch Creek, in the Crowsness River above Crowsness Lake and Blairmore Creek. During periods of low precipitation and in late summer, these coal mines could be using upwards of 40% of the water at that time of the year. And that is a significant amount of water use quantitatively. And it's the kind of volume extraction that could significantly affect 
ecosystem integrity in terms of benthos and other dynamics of aquatic ecosystems. So water use, in fact, can be a significant problem, particularly in late summer and early winter, and particularly at the headwaters. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Okay, let's shift to mine reclamation. Um, so we needed a mechanism to, to reclaim these mines. We followed a template of what has happened with tech coal in the Elk Valley. And so we see that mine reclamation rates are likely to achieve a maximum of about 80 hectares per year and a total of about 2,400 hectares after five decades. Now, if they did that, they would basically be reclaiming the fraction that we see in green, about one quarter, which is that fraction here, and this is a graph from the Elk Valley, as showing how well tech coal, this is the total amount of area they've disturbed, and here's the total amount of area that they haven't reclaimed, the difference is that which they have reclaimed. And so if the operators, as small as they are, as described by Bobby, do as well as a multi-billion dollar company on the BC side has done, we would see about one quarter of this essentially 100 square kilometers or 94 square kilometers reclaimed at five decades. And so this reclamation trajectory represents a pattern, again, that we've observed in the Elk Valley of Southeast BC. And coal mining companies really have no track record of reclaiming old mine sites to a level that fully restores previous ecosystem function. Um, I'd say that the, the reclamation often consists of re-sculpting the macro topography and revegetating mine sites with you know, green vegetation, but that does not necessarily mean that they're restoring the previous hydrology and habitat suitability. There's a, that's an entirely different thing. And I'd say there's currently no technology to restore native high elevation fescue grasslands, which are a very significant and important habitat type on these landscapes. But what about costs? So using a moderate reclamation rate of $100,000 per hectare, a reclamation rate designed to provide some reasonable level of post-mine form and function, the cost would approximate about six to eight million dollars per year and over five decades would represent about $1 billion of complete reclamation. Now, according to McKenna Geotechnical, um, in, in May of 2021, companies typically underestimate the actual reclamation costs by two to tenfold. And then furthermore, bonds secured by government seldom exceed 10% of the reclamation costs. So as such, the amount of bond funds typically secured is generally about 1% of the actual costs needed to achieve reclamation. So what we'd see is about, about one quarter of the area reclaimed, about $250 million spent if they do as well as elk, and that would still leave three quarters of it unreclaimed and therefore a significant liability that would go on for a long period of time. So the proposed mines are situa situated within some of the best remaining habitat for threatened West Slope cutthroat trout, which have lost much of their habitat in the East Slopes of Alberta. Now here we're looking at the headwaters of the old man in this image and this image, and we can see the dendritic pattern of all the creeks. Here we get to see where the proposed mines are. But in red, we get to see some of the best remaining cutthroat trout habitat left in these slopes. And so since the mining activity will directly remove all or nearly all of the vegetation streams and fish habitat um, within the disturbance footprint, this will lead to a loss of about 3,200 hectares of riparian habitat. And in turn, this will cause a substantial reduction in the amount and suitability of habitat for your cutthroat trout and will obviously have an adverse effect on the population and we would expect it to decline. Now, this in fact has been what we have observed in the neighboring Elk Valley of Southeast BC over the last few decades. And so we could also expect similar dynamics to play out with bull trout as well. So these images of four different um, leases, four of the eight showing just the satellite imagery and then in red showing the riparian habitat, which is the stream proper plus 100, no, excuse me, 50 meter buffers on each side. So a total of 100 meters um, shows what fraction of these lease sites are gonna be altered by coal mines. So you can readily see that these systems are significant fractions of these headwater systems. The creek itself plus riparian habitat is critical 
to maintaining ecosystem function and species like West Slope cutthroat trout. Now the proposed lines are situated, as you can see, this is the area that most of the, that all of these eight mines um, are situated within lands that the government of Alberta and Canada has classified as critical wildlife habitat, especially in terms of connectivity corridors for species such as grizzly bears, West Slope cutthroat trout, and bull trout. And here using an LC's um, metric on watershed integrity, where integrity is high in green and low in red, how we've already lost so much of the integrity of this basin, but there's a few places where it remains high. And of course, that's precisely where these coal mines are going to go. And so the ecosystem integrity and connectivity corridors that we have would be significantly compromised if this goes forward. Now, shifting to greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, the whole CO2E scenario stuff, our simulation suggests that development of the proposed mines, if all eight of these mines go forward, could contribute an additional 1,900 million metric ton of CO2E over the 50 year time frame. So almost 2 billion metric ton. Now this is full combustion, meaning that, you know, how much CO2 we is, is, is incorporated in that coal, assuming it's going to be combusted, whether it's combusted in Alberta or in, in China, it really doesn't matter from a climate change perspective. That amount is roughly equivalent to seven years of Alberta's current total CO2 e emission from all sources. That's massive. So the magnitude of these emissions would, would greatly reduce the ability of Alberta and Canada, as I see it, as a whole to meet its current CO2E reduction targets um, that they've committed to, let alone more stringent commitments that are coming in the uh, years and decades in the future. It's worth noting that the International Energy Agency, the IEA, um, they've developed a plausible scenario which already shows that existing sources of metallurgical coal already that have already been built would be sufficient to meet global demands through 2050. There thus could be you know, really no short-term need for development of the proposed mines. They are not necessarily essential for continuing global steel production. There are others that are out there that can meet that. So in summary, the current values of the old man watershed in terms of these headwaters, they're critical for provision of water quality and quantity. I think that case is very strong. They provide important habitat connectivity at local, regional, and international scales. They're, they offer refugia for remaining populations and habitat for endangered species, such as, as West Slope cutthroat trout. They're one of the last landscapes supporting uh, traditional cow-calf operations on native fescue grasslands. Um, I think our results support that if surface coal mining does proceed in the headwaters of the old man, it would create certainly challenges relating to selenium toxicity of water unless very high recovery rates, and I mean greater than 90%, could be maintained over exceptionally long temporal, temporal scales, decades to centuries. And if that isn't successful, it would in fact jeopardize all of the downstream land uses. Although the gross water demand from coal mining would be low at the total scale of the basin, it would be high in the basin's headwaters, particularly in late summer, and during winter months. Loss of water quantity, water quality in terms of selenium and loss of lodic and riparian habitat all represent risks to threatened West Slope cutthroat trout populations. Loss of wilderness integrity and connectivity along these slopes would occur. Large multi-decadal mine reclamation liabilities would be assumed. And I think it would injure Alberta's and Canada's ability to achieve its national, provincial, and international commitments to greenhouse gas emissions. So I think my final thoughts would be that Alberta needs to learn to kind of abandon this land use idiom that we can do everything, everywhere, all the time. In fact, all land uses create benefits. They, they all create liabilities. There are these very real trade-offs that we tend to ignore and externalize. And by looking at individual projects and rather the cumulative approach, it's very easy to ignore those. It's very convenient to ignore them. Rather, we need to recognize that the, um, the primary purpose of these slopes, I think, is water and watershed protection. The East Slopes is already busy providing key deliverables to Albertans and people elsewhere. Water, sustainable beef, recreational opportunities, adding a large coal mine trajectory, in my view, to this 
precious renewable ecosystem will cause significant and lasting damage. It is likely a significant damage um, to the current land uses in the natural capital of these slopes. And um, with that, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to give a presentation and, and pass it back to Jen. Oh, thank you, Brad. Once again, uh, just a, such a significant amount of important information in such a very quick, compressed amount of time. Um, I really appreciate your final thoughts and your summaries. Um, and folks, just a reminder that those of you who have registered will be receiving a copy of this presentation. So you'll be able to, to refer back to this information. Um, we do have one question for you, Brad, um, from Diane. And folks, if you do have questions for Brad, please uh, take the time to, uh, to write them into the Q&A area. Um, so the question is, if coal is not needed globally, what is the purpose of these mines? And is it about, uh, is this really about water licenses? Hmm. Well, even though I think you can make the ma mathematical argument that there's existing coal mines out there to meet global demand, and especially if we're on a reasonable trajectory towards renewables, um, there is money to be made by the current suite of investors, in this case, primarily Australian, if they can get permission to move, move forward and, and, and extract and market 700 million uh, metric ton, um, you can imagine at $1,000 a ton, there's a significant amount of money to be made by those companies. Um, so I have no doubt that if they proceed, someone's going to make some money. The question is, how is it going to be distributed? And I think Bobby has spoken to whether or not the, the tax base and the royalty base is good and competitive and would deliver to Albertans the kind of economic benefits that, that Albertans would want. Um, again, I think most of those analyses continue to occur by externalizing um, our understanding of the economic value of natural capital, externalizing the, the role of greenhouse gases, externalizing the cost of cleaning up water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, someone's going to make money if those mines move forward. And because of the material nature of, of coal commodities, um, when coal is high, everyone goes hard. And when coal prices drop, uh, the history has been that coal mines shut down and communities take a hit. Um, so water is a lasting commodity. And we should, we should understand it. We should commodify it. We should understand it has true value. Um, and so it's, it appears to be a trade-off between short-term economic benefits by some investors on the coal side against the long-term economic liabilities on water quality and quantity, which is something our kids, grandkids, and great-great-grandkids might want to think about. Yeah. Um, okay, so on st staying with the theme of water, um, another question. Coal companies say they can divert water and capture it in the spring to use it in the low-volume parts of the year. Um, if this, if they do, how would this impact the watershed and ecosystem? And and let's just, can they actually do it? Well, I think they can, and I think it causes some benefits. Um, so basically, what we're saying is that if water flow is really high in the spring, and it's really low in late summer and winter, why don't we capture some of the spring stuff, hold it back? And again, what we're doing is we're playing God in, in the system and we're anthropogenically creating what I'd call Atlantic system reservoirs. We're holding volume back. And so that solves the problem or mitigates the problem of not exacerbating low flow in late summer and winter, that's true. But then we're also playing with the, what, what aquatic ecologists call vernal discharge or spring meltwater. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be high in the spring. Those <laughs> dynamics are really important. So now we're clawing back on that water because we want to hold it so we yeah. can meter it out in late summer. So it's not like it's a, it's a perfect solution. It's an engineering strategy that solves one problem, but contrib contributes to another. So yeah, and, and we have witnessed that over and over again, like globally, that you cut off the lead supply. And as you go further downstream, it just affects more and more, well, living beings, really, anything that's depending on that water flow, right? We are, yeah, you're absolutely right. We are playing God, aren't we? Well, cottonwood systems that everyone loves to watch in the old man downstream, those systems live and live and breathe and die by whether or not there's good spring, spring floods. Um, so we need the sediment at that time of the year. We need 
those young um, coppices or the seed to establish. And every time we put in a, um, a dam and we interfere with flow, there's going to be a consequence. And, uh, and maybe that's the wise thing to do, but I think we should also be blunt that there's no free lunch on this. There will be a consequence. Yeah. Um, so this may be a question uh, more for you, Bobby, but um, the question is, so 1,500 jobs, huge devastation to the environment, particularly water, as we've been discussing. Um, is anyone following the money? Is anyone following where this money? I mean, you touched on that, Brad, about shareholders and you know the mine company owners and the board of directors, but is anyone actually following this and documenting it that we know of? Um, I can't say that I know of anyone directly following the money. I mean, there's been lots of people who have you know, taken a look at what's happened behind the scenes to accept the extent that money is available or sorry, not money, but information is available. But I mean, fundamentally, um, what do you have to work with? You know, as Brad said, that the mining companies don't do these types of things unless there is money in it for them. So, I mean, their motivation is fairly clear and I would be reluctant to speculate on, you know, what uh, might be driving others other than the things that we've already spoken to like perceived economic value. Okay. Um, can we talk about just for a moment, um, selenium and, and controlling it or pulling it out of the water, Brad, you, you said 99% of the selenium would have to be removed downstream from the mine. Is there a, a process in place to do this successfully that, that you know of, that any of you know of? I think the applicants, the proposals, the proponents have said that they'll do whatever is required to keep the selenium concentration below um, existing limits. And as Bobby's mentioned, it would appear that those thresholds seem to be changing. Maybe if we can't get the concentrations lower, maybe we can just elevate the, uh, the toxic concentrations and establish new limits. So Alberta, I think, is not necessarily at the leading edge of trying to maintain healthy selenium toxicity thresholds. Now, these companies in Alberta are small. They're junior companies. Um, they may be tied to big money somewhere else, but they're relatively poorly capitalized Com um, companies. So I would look at tech. I mean, tech has been doing this for decades in Southeast BC in the Elk Water, uh, in the Elk River drainage basin. They have spent arguably hundreds of millions, I think, actually billions of dollars trying to figure out how to get selenium out of water so that they can meet the needs of their stakeholder communities in the elk and further downstream in the states. Um, American stakeholders are very concerned that selenium concentrations are too high. Um, tech has spent heroic effort um, in research and in operational infrastructure to try and get selenium out with some success. Um, but I think they would admit that it's a very, very difficult thing to do and that they cannot say that they are successful at doing it over large spatial scales and large temporal scales. Um, I think they would hope they would be, but um, they have been, um, they've observed some very unpleasant consequences where things haven't turned out as well as they had hoped for some of their plants. And uh, certainly West Slope Cutthroat Trout populations have struggled um, there's been some well-publicized events um, concerning selenium and tech and Southeast BC and coal. So if a really large company that appears to be taking this very seriously is encountering that much challenge, why would we think that much smaller junior companies in Alberta are going to do any better? So I think we can just all agree it's a daunting task. It is. And, and you're absolutely right. So, you know, we look at the massive mines. I mean, you've referred to Australia quite often, and we would hear about that success story because it would, I would think that we, in my naivety, I would think that we would hear about the success story behind selenium removal because that would be a really, really effective PR tool for the coal mines, correct? So. Yeah, it would be, but um, also the kind of heavy metals and, and Bill Donahue's work shows us that it, you really also have to understand, Jen, the um, 
the geologic nature of the substrate, the parent material. And in mm -hmm. some places in Australia, selenium may not be and is not the big issue that we have here. So other, other heavy metals might be. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about selenium, but I think as Alan mentioned, it's only one of many heavy metals that, um, that should be of concern. And it's not often just the one component, it's mixed in with others, whether it be on the water side or the air side, it's the, it's the mixture of these compounds that ultimately uh, may be the ones that we need to be concerned about and not just acute, but chronic exposures to. Mm -hmm. So uh, you touched about uh, on about reclamation and the small percentage that actually takes place after a mine is closed. Um, what sort of landscape and vegetation um, can we expect? Uh, you know, do, is there the ability to actually put back the native grass? You, uh, you referred to fiscu, right? Uh, is there that ability to do that? Or do they like what, what defines mine uh, reclamation today of that 25%? Well, I think coal mine mining companies have shown us that, quote, they can reclaim industrial mining landscapes if required to, and if they have adequate funds, and Bobby talked about whether or not those funds may or may not be there. Um, but I think we need to distinguish, as Alberta, the, the difference between, you know, if you're going to move, say, 6 billion cubic meters of overburden, so the tops of mountains are going to come down, yeah. and the valleys, to, you know, metaphorically are going to come up, you can, and, and moving that stuff around is, is, is obscenely expensive, right? Um, every cubic meter is about one metric ton. So what companies prefer to do is to sculpt it into a aesthetically appealing landscape <laughs> and put um, soil on top of it, topsoil, to the extent that they can establish green vegetation. Historically, um, in many cases, in earlier decades, it was largely agronomic species, often exotics. Um, I think the coal sector has done a good, a better job of incorporating native vegetation. I believe they've done that. But that kind of macro visual of sculpted landscapes with green vegetation, I think is fundamentally good, but that does not speak to the function. Like that's the form side. Yeah. To me, I'm wondering and more concerned about, about ecosystem function and the, and the basic hydrology of whether water is moving the way it should, because that's all beneath the ground, it's out of sight, exceptionally difficult to study. And I think those kind of patterns, those kind of dynamics are only going to be um, well understood over several decades or generations of study. So, so can, we, um, can we make it look pretty? Yeah, we can. Can we improve our ability to use native vegetation? Yes, but although I think some of the native fescues are gonna be exceptionally challenging. Um, can we put the system back the way it was? Absolutely not. Yeah. And I think we just need to accept that or understand that and say, okay, is that, is that an acceptable outcome? Um, because if we fundamentally alter the hydrology, um, that's something we'll live with for indefinitely. Okay, so a um, couple more questions, and then we'll we'll just do a wrap up. But um, one comment here is: I see blockades coming. Would not all the landowners and ranchers in this south organize a blockade or block all the rural roads and block any industry access? Why not? What are your thoughts on that? And this goes out to all of you, um, Alan, Bobby, and Brad. Do you have thoughts on that? Of you know, making it. A very, uh, very visual and extreme comment on not wanting think, this to move forward. I think from an LLG perspective, you know, we see a lot of value in trying to drive change through the mechanisms that are in front of us, like trying to, you know, influence the policy committee, get the right kind of policy recommendation. Um, having said that, there is great value, and we've seen it in the amount of public outcry you know that's occurred um and the attention that that has drawn you know to the issue from politicians because i mean let's be honest votes do count so you know at, at this point there's really nothing to blockade you know we're, we're trying to address the fact that um we don't want it to be an environment where work is proceeding that requires us 
to blockade. So mm-hmm. what I'd be encouraging people to do right now is more to make sure their voice gets heard through the online process that the coal policy committee has, you know, to continue to make noise to politicians and decision makers and let them know what, you know, your views are, you know, of what's being proposed. You know, whether or not at some point it becomes, you know, um, a different type of protest, you know, hopefully we won't get there. Hopefully we'll be able to stop this before we're actually seeing it develop. Yeah. So um, dovetailing into that, another question is, are there efforts taking place right now to halt coal exploration until all of the coal mining is stopped? So one of the things I think that was a success for us and and for other groups was to get the government to actually halt the coal exploration. Um, And that was done, I think it was on my timeline back in April Mm -hmm. of this year. I mean, one of the positions we and many others took was that um, how can you progress with a public consultation process if you're allowing people to continue to destroy the very areas that are under discussion? So, I mean, the government did put um, a halt on exploration. It um, means that there are areas where exploration has occurred that hasn't been reclaimed yet, but at least there's not new exploration happening on the category two lands, which were the most sensitive areas Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where the decision of this policy committee becomes key because we want to make sure that it doesn't get restarted okay thank you so there's one more question um, for you brad around surface okay brad you speak of surface water Um, is the groundwater with an open pit mine a concern too and if so is there any way to measure the contamination of that Mm. Well, I think um, in many ways, and I'm not a hydrologist, but I think the concern about groundwater, the geohydrology of, the, of this dynamic is probably one of the greatest concerns. And existing models, as I understand them, um, are grossly imperfect in terms of, of measuring the change, the spatial change in flow quantitatively and qualitatively. Now, we get to see um, What's, what selenium comes out of the water. Like when you're looking at a river, a lot of that water in the river, of course, has come from groundwater and we get to see its effects at scales downstream. But the actual detailed movement of water in groundwater at those high elevation um, basins is largely unknown. And companies like Tech have spent, I'd say heroic dollars um, with modelers, um, some that I, that I work with, try and understand how that, that happens. And it's early days. These are exceptionally complex systems that require very difficult um, modeling programs, very difficult to attribute these models and explore their spatial and temporal dynamics. So yeah, that's critical. Um, we're guessing and, um, and no one's built good models of the headwaters of the Old Man River drainage basin to say, okay, if you were to build these eight mines like we we simulated surface flow we did not simulate groundwater because we can't we don't know how to um but it certainly is a very very deserving question and and i guess the question is why would we want to jeopardize that until we know what those consequences are wouldn't we want to have data sets and models and expertise before we actually um build a brand new land use of 100 square kilometers of active coal mining footprint in the headwaters of the old man it seems to me that would be a prudent way to, to think about this. Well, there's the age old question, right? Humans don't seem very good at thinking down the road. We seem to like to uh, act and react very quick, quickly, don't we? Um, so we are coming up to the top of our second hour and uh, we want to respect everyone's time and especially you, Brad, Allen, and Bobby at the, uh, at the end of a day. Um, Just in closing, uh, is there anything that you each or any of or all of you would like to share with our audience around um, recommended next steps, uh, anything that we can do, um, you know, just some specifics, places we can go to, uh, people we can get in touch with to either learn more uh, or learn more and uh, push forth, uh, you know, the 
the, the need to take this seriously. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just start with uh, Brad, your microphone is off, so I'll start with you. Well, um, you know, I think we need to be mindful that all humans, uh, we can't exist without land use, we need energy. Coal represents one example of energy. Um, you know, given our current global situation and the alternatives for energy, is it in Alberta's best, is it in Alberta's, Alberta's best interest to fire up a uh, coal mining trajectory in the year of, you know, 2021? Mm -hmm. um, isn't there better ways of doing it? Um, I think Albertans have heard a lot of the prospective benefits from coal mining from the government and from the coal mining sector, which they should, you know, they should promote that. Maybe they're optimistic, um, but Albertans deserve, I think, a, um, an equal understanding empirically of the other side of the ledger. What are the costs, the economic and environmental costs? So metaphorically, I, I think, Jan, the, um, the blockades have already happened. They're maybe not physically on a road. Um, the provincial government has heard from a lot of Albertans that, my goodness, they want to know both sides of the equation. So if I were an Albertan, you know, give me good understandings of both the benefits and the liabilities. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Um, Alan, next, any thoughts or last words? Don't, don't let up. The, uh, the current government is probably only waiting for us to get tired and then we'll be back in the mess. So we have to keep the pressure on the politicians. That means continuous letters, meet with your MLA, um, talk to the opposition parties. I'm not picking any one of them and just keep slugging. This will be a long, long process. It is a process, not a, not a, an event. Yes. We're in for the marathon, not the sprint, eh? Or an ultra marathon. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Bobby, any last words, recommendations, thoughts from you? Well, I'd, I'd really like to thank all the people who have hung in here for the two hours and participated because you, you do make a difference. Just the fact that you're listening and understanding and care about this is huge. And to translate that into action, I mean, I would echo everything Brad and Alan have said. I would also encourage you to go to the um, Alberta government's uh, Coal Policy Committee website and to submit your own personal comments. They do have a link there and I will put it up on our website here this week, but they have a, they have a link where you can actually submit your own comments. And I think to date, they've only got about 500 comments from um, you know, individual citizens. Uh, which when I say only, I mean, I guess that's pretty good, but I would love to see 25,000 again, mm -hmm. you know, saying that this is not what we want, because I think that really is the only way we're going to get this turned around is to have the people of Alberta so strongly protest that the government is compelled to recognize that um, coal mining does not fit with the values of the people in this province. So, you know, keep, keep speaking, keep communicating and keep sharing with other people because surprisingly, there are still a lot of people in Alberta who are really not aware of the extent of this issue and the magnitude of change that it uh, would cause you know, to our mountains and foothills. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, this is, uh, it, you know, in, in a time when it is so easy just to read a headline or, you know, stick with your favorite social media and get a very structured message. I personally appreciate the, the facts, the science behind the facts, um, because that's, that's the best way that we can draw positive con conclusions. And I mean, positive as in, properly defined and, and um, structured <laughs> information that we can work with. So thanks to all of you. Thanks for including me uh, in this presentation. Um, folks, the, you can, as I, just a reminder again, that you will be, uh, as a registrant, you will be receiving uh, a copy of this presentation via email within the next 24 to 48 hours. And um, there's always, uh, I think you can always go to the website, the LLC website as well, right, to, to get information and to find resources and documentation. 
All right, so with that, I uh, will call it uh, an end. Uh, wish you all very well, both our attendees and our panelists. And once again, thanks to everyone for, for being a part of this. All right, goodbye, everyone.